welcome to Friends in Fiction, five best-selling authors, endless stories. Friends in Fiction is a Facebook Live program with five best-selling novelists whose common love of reading, writing, and independent bookstores bound them together with chats, author interviews, and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing. These friends discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Best-selling novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, Patty Callahan Henry, and Mary Alice Monroe are five longtime friends with more than 80 published books to their credit. At the start of the pandemic, they got together for a virtual happy hour to talk about their books, their favorite bookstores, writing, reading, and publishing in this new uncharted territory. They're still talking, and they've added fascinating discussions with other best-selling novelists. So join them live on their Friends and Fiction Facebook group page every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern, or listen and view later at your leisure on their podcast or on their website at www.friendsandfiction.com. Welcome, everybody, to Monday on our monthly bonus episode, which means it's time for Friends in Fiction, five best-selling authors, endless stories. I'm Mary Kay Andrews, and I'm hosting our guest, Nally Dupree. My forthcoming novel, The Newcomer, will be out from St. Martin's Press on May Hi, I'm Kristen Harmel, and my next novel, The Forest of Vanishing Stars, will be out July 6th from Gallery Books. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey, and my next book, Under the Southern Sky, will be out April 20th. I am Patty Callahan Henry, and my new novel comes out on March 9th, and it is called Surviving Savannah. And hello, I'm Mary Alice Monroe, and my new novel, The, no the Summer of Lost and Found, is out May 11th. And as I've already mentioned, our wait, did I forget somebody? No, no, no. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Last, that was me last time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Patty. You forgot our friends behind the scenes people, but no. Tonight's author is Natalie Dupree, whose latest cookbook is Natalie Dupree Favorite Stories and Recipes. And Natalie is the James Beard Award winning author of 15 cookbooks. She's also starred in more than 300 television episodes for the Food Network. Wow. Yeah. PBS and the Learning Channel. Her best-selling book, New Southern Cooking, started an entire culinary movement. She's won James Beard Awards for Southern Memories and Comfortable Entertaining, as well as her as as well as Natalie Dupree's Mastering the Art of Southern Cooking, which is kind of the Bible now. Yeah. Yeah. She writes for the Charleston Post and Courier and does short videos for them, as well as occasionally for other publications. Her husband, Jack Bass, is the author of nine books on the American South. And since we are talking about books and bookstores, this week's indie bookstore is Buxton Books in Charleston. The owner, Polly Buxton, has said she had only one dream since she was in her late teens, to create a bookstore in downtown Charleston that supported the writing and reading community, a place that stimulated creativity and conversation. This week, Buxton Books is offering a 10% discount on books by all by our guest, Natalie, as well as by the five Friends in Fiction authors with the code FRIENDSFICTION10. You'll find the link to the store on the website and on our Facebook page. Sean, will you bring on Natalie? Yay! Hey, Natalie. Hi, Natalie. Hi, Natalie. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> so I'm excited. I'm it's so glad to see you all. Pretty yeah, tough. Natalie, we, I've decided that this week we're going to change it up a little bit. Instead of Friends in Fiction, I think we're going to call it Friends in Foodie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like that. Now, since I've been a fan of yours since I first watched your cooking show on PBS, and of course your books are the stars of my groaning shelves of cookbook. <laughs> I thought I brought them with me. Let me, uh, I'll grab it in a minute. Um, it's the entertaining one where you have this lavish, um, you know, the one I mean with the lavish yeah. hair? Of course. Oh, that one. This is yeah. right. Yeah. Let me grab it. Right. Gonna, That's right. a very nice book, my entertainment. Yes, it's beautiful. In fact, when I was looking through it <laughs> yesterday, I thought, I think I might make that chocolate chest pie. Ooh, <laughs> right. 
That's what I figured you were talking about with the big know. hair. Yeah, big <laughs> hair. How old were you in that? That you look like 20. She was 20. Well, I wasn't 20. 29. <laughs> I took my first cooking class at 30. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. So now but big hair covered a lot of sins. <laughs> <laughs> Callie, I can remember our past first cross when I was a feature writer for the AJC, the Atlanta Constitution. You were the columnist. Then I was lucky enough to beg invites to your legendary book parties at your uh, home in Midtown Atlanta. Now, I know you're in the middle of a big life change right now. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, we decided about a month ago uh, to go up to Raleigh just to look at uh places for people, quote, over 55, unquote, <laughs> uh, to have independent living. And they had a an apartment available, a two-bedroom apartment available. And Jack has three children in Raleigh, which he wanted me to mention. And so, um, so um, that's what happened. Uh, they had an apartment available, so we said we were going. So we're moving like December 1st or 3rd or something. Like like that. Almost oh tomorrow. My That's goodness. like unbelievable. Oh my gosh. We are in shock in Charleston. Just oh. utter shock. I mean, all of us, five of us here are just you know, well, so you'll be close to me, time. Natalie. So I'm not in shock. I'll just come visit you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's right. you can do that. And North Hills, North Hills has great restaurants right there, mm -hmm. and of right. course, Bell Ridge Books is right there. So right. that's right. Where do you need? They, 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 they just moved there, haven't they? Uh, yeah. A couple yeah. of years ago, actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a terrific, it's a terrific location. That's great. okay, Kristen. We're gonna get right to it. Um, Kristen, you have a question for Natalie, right? Yeah. So Natalie, it's so nice to meet you. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about food and stories. So my 2012 novel, The Sweetness of Forgetting, is about a family bakery that actually holds deep family secrets from the Holocaust. And part of the plot involves the idea that the family's history has been there all along baked right into the recipes, even if the younger generation didn't know it. That idea has always meant a lot to me, this idea that there are stories in everything we cook. I know that in your cookbooks, especially Natalie Dupree's favorite stories and recipes, you often include stories with your recipes. Can you talk a little bit about that and why it's important to you and, and why uh, food and stories sort of inevitably go hand in hand? Well, when actually, when I was uh, working at the Atlanta Journal Constitution with uh, Mary Kay, um, see, I said it. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the editor, the features editor, suggested to me that because I liked writing food and and uh, stories, that I write a column about food and relationships. Ooh. And food is a control issue. It is like the the most powerful thing there is. You know, it controls countries. You think of famines. You think of of times of abundance. You know, think of all the stories that are in the Bible uh, about food, yeah. and you you just sort of amazed about what like manna from heaven, you know, yeah. and, uh, on to to uh, the Pharaoh that learned that there were going to be seven years of feast and seven years of famine. And uh, so, so, um, so I've always been convinced that food is the most important thing to write about, that it's, that it's involved in all of our lives. Uh, in every way, even if we don't like food, uh, there are people that don't like to eat. Um, we still have to eat. It's the first thing that we do when we're born, and it's the last thing we get a choice about when we die. You know, you can choose whether or not to go on those tubes. Yeah, and, um, 
And Ann Siddons, one of our favorite, one of my favorite writers, uh, brought me a, a pamphlet when my mother was dying. And it was really important. Uh, it was, it said that we enter a euphoria when we uh, are dying and we don't have food and, and drink. <clears throat> and in particular, I guess it's water that does it. But when you don't have food and water, you go into a euphoria and that allows you to pass on. So without ah, that, I did not know that. That's right. I didn't either. Um, I did it. And it was so comforting to me um, that it, 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 uh, it meant that I could let my mother go without insisting Wow. that you stay alive just to make me not feel guilty about taking her off of wow um, of wow things so uh, that, so that was wonderful and wow. uh, i was very grateful for it wow gosh but, food and life go together yeah. hand in hand yeah. yeah yeah right i mean food is more important than sex Really? You yes, know, you can live without without that, but you can't live without food. I, I, everybody always talked about sex being the most important thing in the marriage, but I still believe that it was. Food. That it's food. I would think both husbands would agree. After a certain point, they start. <laughs> right. And the older you get, the more important it is. <laughs> Hey, honey, what's for dinner? <laughs> Patty, you have a question for, for uh, Natalie, don't you? Yeah, I have a thousand questions for Natalie, but I picked just one. So, Natalie, you know how much I love seeing you, and you know how grateful I've been to you through the years, and how your home in Charleston, I can't imagine anybody else living in that house. I can't believe you're leaving. It feels kind of shocking. But I first met you in Charleston with Mary Alice and Marjorie Wentworth, our poet laureate. Um, she was the poet laureate of South Carolina at the time years ago. And since then, you've given parties for my book releases. And I've been to so many others that you've done for other authors. So even beyond cooking, you've been a force in the literary world, giving soirees, introducing us all to each other, making sure we're connected. And I know you did this even back in Atlanta. So I want you to talk about that legacy you've left. I think it's part of your hostess heart, not just for cooking, but for gathering people. I think it's your legacy in many ways. Well, I do love, I just love having people over. And I didn't know that there was such a thing as a connector. I mean, there are all sorts of new words uh, for social uh, interactions. Yeah. And um, so someone told me that I was the connector and I was sort of startled. But then I realized that they were right, that that was the thing that I loved doing most was was uh, connecting people, introducing people uh, to people they married, or or one one girlfriend of mine um, who lives in in Florida uh, that when she was a member, we were both members and are both members of the International Association of Culinary Professionals, and for four of her books, we were sitting at the same table. And I introduced her to a publisher that published her book. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm sure she's very grateful. <laughs> well, she, well, we laugh about it, you know, yes. Uh, they weren't published my books, but they were very interested in hers. Cause, <laughs> oh, that's so uh, funny. You know, she believes in diet food. I mean. <laughs> Healthy food. Ooh. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> That's in the same category as the people you were saying that don't really like to eat. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there, are people, there are people who, there are people who eat they're, their body. They're the people eating the diet. They don't really care about how the food tastes. They just want it. They know, know they need nutrition and it's fuel. Right. And that's all they're interested in. Yeah. yeah. Right. 
that's it's, it's the difference between loving to eat and eat, eating, eating and and living to eat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> took me a minute, but you know what I meant. Yeah. 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 Right. Alex, you've got a question, don't you? I do. Well, first of all, everyone out there, we mentioned this in the introduction. This is the Bible, Mastering the Art of Southern Cooking. It really is. And it is what's for Southern cooking, what Julia Child did for French cooking. And if you're a Southern cook it's a must have and it makes a great christmas gift for the person you know who loves to cook in the su southern food and doesn't have the book but speaking of um being the julia child i have been in your kitchen as patty said and um, it's always so much fun to get there a little early you know when when there's a soiree you go through it's a charleston single house and you walk up the the side porch and there's Jack with the bar yeah. and the coolers and you come in and you kind of stand in the front and you kind of get little foyer and there's paintings everywhere. Yeah, I mean, it's love. You have great art. And so you kind of check out who's in the front and then there's the dining room which the moment Natalie puts food on the table, the men. <laughs> <laughs> the table, don't they, Natalie? And it's, it's gone. So if you funny. hurry up and get something, it's gone. Those men hoard the plates. And it's a, it's really a lot of fun. And in the back room is where often Natalie would sit with the bookseller and the books would be signed. And it was always so special. And then right next to that is your kitchen. And everyone would think that someone who is the doyen of cooking, the major chef, would have this huge kitchen. Think Julia Child again, right? You, your kitchen is much more like Julia Child's. It's very French, very, and I wouldn't say petite, it's, what would you describe? Well, it's, it's smaller than hers was. But uh, but hers always looked small in the photographs. Yeah, but she had an eating kitchen at table, though. <laughs> oh, she did. All right, you didn't have that. But when you think that you created not only you know all those recipes, but a masterpiece like this in a small kitchen, I just found that so. Every time I looked at it, I was inspired that there was hope for someone like me. You know, because you knew the true art of cooking. You didn't need the fancy machines and all that. You knew how to get it done. So two questions. What do you think are the essentials in a kitchen? What is absolutely must-haves? And also, if I looked in your fridge, what would be the one thing I would always find? Well, you know you'd always find butter. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I mean, always, and heavy cream, because you can always nice. make a meal. Yeah. and eggs so the basics you know the basics and then i live in the south so pecans or pecans if you want to call them that way yeah. and then in the freezer i always have frozen peaches um oh, no, I didn't fresh ones if i can get them but otherwise frozen peaches and i always have self-rising flour for for a cobbler Ooh. Oh, because you can always whip something up yeah, you can always make a cobbler. And ah. what's bad about a peach cobbler? I mean, <laughs> someone from Seattle once told me that they couldn't put put peach cobbler on their menu because people would know that if the peaches were frozen, you know. And I thought, <laughs> what's wrong with it? Of course. Of course. I hate to tell we're them, but really, it's very... Yeah, it's very well, February, February. It's it's frozen shrimp. <laughs> right, exactly. You know? That's what I was going to say. We're yeah. willing, willing to eat uh, shrimp from China, shrimp <laughs> from Asia. That God knows where what it ate when it's right underneath a silk tree and the silkworms yeah. drop into oh, yeah. the <laughs> water. We're willing to eat that, but we're not going to eat a peach frozen. that was frozen fresh oh give me a break so what's your favorite tool and what's of all the instruments or tools or even appliance what's your favorite well i i can't imagine not having a whisk a whisk was the first uh really the first step out of myself uh whisk thing that i bought when i was interested in cooking but hadn't taken any cooking classes. 
And I bought the wrong kind of whisk. I bought a round whisk that kind of, you go like that. It's weird. Oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. I don't know what people do with it. Uh, rather than a rotary whisk. And I couldn't understand why I couldn't whisk <laughs> when recipe said whisk. I, I wouldn't, I just couldn't understand it. <laughs> so that's why I like demystifying cooking because yeah. it, it's not fair that you're supposed to know yeah. which whisk yeah. to buy. It's just mm -hmm. not fair. And uh, there's a lot of stuff that's, not fair going back to what christy talked about uh a lot of southern women didn't know how to cook they had to or or they weren't allowed in the kitchen uh, because a, a tyrant was there that wouldn't let them in um and so they had to they had to uh learn on their own mm -hmm. and wow. or they could watch one of your cooking shows or right. they could watch one of my cooking shows <laughs> Yeah. Well, take a class at uh, at take a class at the old Riches Department Store, where Natalie taught a, a live cooking class for many years. Right, Natalie? Right, nearly ten years. Yeah, um, a lot of people went through that school. Yes, I think I had ten thousand students. I finally counted them. Wow. I went down one time and counted them, and and uh, so they all learned to make biscuits and pie crust. And I think awesome. that gives me the most pleasure because they mm -hmm. they learn. And if it wasn't a whisk, it would be a a rolling pin, I guess. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Rolling pins really important as well. Now, Chris, you've got a you've got a question for I now. do, I do, and I, I love that story. I'm sorry about my light, but I'm in it now. I can't really <laughs> <laughs> I'm never sitting here like late afternoon, so this is yeah. what's happening. Um, I have a rainbow on me. It's lovely. Um, but um, I love that what you just said because I remember being in college and my grandmother would always help. She makes this amazing caramel cake. And I was trying to make one for my husband for his birthday. Well, he wasn't my husband then. He's my husband now. And it was the first birthday we were dating and he loved caramel cake. And I could not get it right. And I finally no. got in the car and drove from Chapel Hill to Salisbury and sat in her kitchen so that she could make the icing work. And she just does it like it's nothing. And it just pops right out. And I'm like, I've done this 10 times and it's not working. Um, so that is not even really Related to my question, um, my my question is: You are such a noted hostess, and I have heard that you have some crazy good hacks, like filling coolers with soapy water to hide pots and pans during a party. So, can you share some of your uh, special hacks with us, so that when life gets back to normal and we can have parties again, that we can entertain like Natalie? Well, that is the most important thing that I have anyone to to tell anybody about Thanksgiving, which is that before you get started, uh, before you start washing the pots and pans, you need to bring in a cooler of hot, soapy water. Genius. And, yeah. and uh, you know, some uh, particularly one on wheels, if you can get one. Mm. Uh, but anyway, you can put it in the bathtub if you need to. Uh, it doesn't matter or out on the or out on the patio and then you take all the last minute pots and pans so the turkey pan after you've made the gravy and the the mashed potato pan oh, yeah. and yeah. Uh, the person like my friend dear friend beverly who will probably watch this but she always brought beverly melander uh Mary Kay, and she would always bring her mashed potatoes because she didn't like mine. <laughs> and we, we, well, actually, she brought a turkey too, which is when I learned that everybody had her turkey. turkeys. She, <laughs> oh my God. She, uh, so we, I always get two small turkeys, like 12 to 13 pounds. And I cook one the night before, and I cut it up and and put it in plastic bags and sort it according to white and dark, and uh -huh. and I serve that, and I make my mashed potatoes the night before, and I reheat them in the microwave or on top of the stove, but it's easier in the microwave. Mm. 
And so then Beverly waltzes in that day with the turkey that she's made that morning. <laughs> and and so I put it, it on the uh, on the sideboard to say this is Beverly's turkey. <laughs> and we can cut it up, we hack it up later. And people yeah. eat my pre-cooked turkey and they just think it's really? great because they're looking at her turkey, eating. which is moist and terrific, but they're eating mine, which <laughs> was made in the calm, in the, and the same thing with mashed potatoes. I love my mashed potatoes and I make them I mean, all ahead. Your family isn't sitting waiting for you to serve and cut and cut and cut. You have it all ready to go. Oh, it's just a nightmare. You know, yeah. food is a control issue. They're already hungry because you're feeding them at some outlandish time in the day where I always insist on eating at noon. And I say, we're eating, show up at noon, you know, have a drink or whatever you want. But we are sitting down when the first child cries or the, yeah. your grandfather gets mean. <laughs> That's a good rule. Like that's that. good advice right there. Yeah, people get hungry. People yeah. get hungry on Thanksgiving. Yeah. But but anyway, Beverly comes in and she mashes her potatoes in the kitchen. <laughs> in the middle of the last kitchen. minute. Oh no. And then I'm left with the dirty pot and I've looked <laughs> I've worked like a slave for three days. And there is that pot. <laughs> and, and so I learned just to put it in the cooler. That's awesome. Oh I think I would send it home with her, Natalie. Well, yes. and she can wash it or she can There's take a it. There's a man potato box. It's up to her. <laughs> yeah. But it's not hidden it. I'm never inviting Matt. I'm never inviting Beverly Molander to my house. To think. <laughs> Neither am I. I think I'm just kidding. I, I put mine in the pot. And they, they and nice the oh, I like that idea. And I, you know, in the crock pot. Yeah. And, it's oh, yes. and then too. I might add some chicken stock or some cream or whatever. So they keep yes. that dried out. Uh, yep. That's a good one for, you know, when you have a ton of, we're, we're not having a ton of people for anything. This, this whole season, season. but yeah. it's it's a nice thing to do. Oh my gosh, that's I'm I'm writing all this down. Patty, right? you've got a lot to take oh, care of. This I know this is genius. Well, I like I like the did idea you of having your cookbook, Kathy. Um, did I put that in the cookbook? I don't think I did, but you know I'm Irish, so mashed potatoes. I would have mashed potatoes three days, you know, three meals a day. I love <laughs> the idea of the um the turkey and the centerpiece. I, when I was writing my cookbook, somebody told me about the concept of the beauty, the beauty dish, which is the one that you put out and take pictures of. So you have the yeah. beauty turkey, and then you have Natalie's turkey. <laughs> I think I'm going to do that from now on. I like that. I get the big 24 pounder just because I can, <laughs> you know, just as big as it'll be. But the two turkeys is really smart. Yeah. Well, the a 24 pounder is huge to cut up. You have a lot of leftovers that you don't want. <laughs> and um, you but it looks like Norman Rockwell. It's harder to cook. It takes up the, the whole oven, you know, doesn't keep, give room for the, for the other things that you have to heat up at the same time. Okay. So I just do the small turkey. And then if I do a small turkey that day, uh, I just, I have room for it in the oven. Yeah. Now I get to ask a question and I, I love asking people, Natalie, you're having a fantasy dinner party. Yeah. <laughs> Who is the guest of honor? Who else is invited? And what are you cooking? Mm. Oh dear. Well, I've had so many, uh, guests of honor. I that, know you have. Uh, you know, um, I've had Craig Claiborne, and and he pinched my friend Elliot at the table, at the dinner table. Oh, he tackle, he pinched Elliot? Huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm going to email Elliot and ask him about that. Right. He, You know, he he's, he's cute. 
you know? <laughs> and, and Craig was a lot older than we were. Uh, so famous people can be bad. <laughs> and, uh, fantasy people, whoever you want at their dinner party, you can have, and what are you going to cook for them? Okay, just please say me because I'm coming whether you invite me. Well, of course, I have all of you. Be better oh. alive, <laughs> I have all of you famous people. Right. <laughs> I know who I wouldn't have. Uh oh, Ooh, that's uh, more fun. Well, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't have Pat Conroy again. I knew you were going to say that. I knew what? <laughs> I mean, I loved Pat Conroy in many, many ways. I but, <laughs> but he it, but he was just not necessarily uh, a good uh, dinner guest. Okay, who, um, who would you have? Fantasy, dead or alive, anybody? Oh, that's such a mean thing. Uh, well, I think Princess Di would be nice. Ooh, you know? Good one. I'd like to see what would like to have on. Yeah. And I'd like to discuss men with her. Yes. You no, know, I, I, I'd like to trash talk with her. And, um, Old jug ears? <laughs> Old jug ears? <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, I'd like to have Sandra Conroy. She's mm -hmm. a oh, yeah, we wouldn't. Yeah. She's a lovely dinner guest. Yeah. Um, I, what would you cook? I would like to have, maybe I would have an all-female dinner. Okay. And I would have Hillary Clinton. Good. Sandra Conroy. All oh. of you. All of you. Oh, you. Uh, <laughs> Diane Princess Di. Um, Fabulous. Couple of uh, Michelle Obama, definitely. Yes. Oh, how cool. Yeah. If she would promise that she wouldn't wear anything sleeveless. <laughs> I mean, can, you, can you tell people that you don't want to look at their arms? I mean, I, my arms have gotten, I can't even wave my arms. I can't even wave goodbye to the grandchildren without being embarrassed. You know, they, they, they resonate. And oh, Natalie. I would have Michelle Obama if she would wear something with arms. Um, <laughs> what's, on your menu, what's on your menu for this fantasy yeah. party? Well, you know, I would ser serve a peach cobbler probably or peaches if I could um, or, or, a, or a, a pecan pastry of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, but I do like my chocolate snowball that's in my... Yes! That's, that's my favorite. That's my favorite. That's yeah. in the book. Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah, chocolate snowball. Because you can just make it and freeze it and then decorate it that morning and it's it done. So we're only having dessert at this at this fantasy well, party? Perfect. Well, dessert party. It's a dessert party. Yeah. Uh, well, I'd have to have shrimp. There's mm -hmm. nothing. There's nothing like South Carolina shrimp. I I don't know. I was a little worried because um, the people that I know that worked on shrimpers in in North Carolina were uh, Robert Coram, who's a writer, and Nick Taylor, who's a writer, and and I know that. Uh, Mary Kay knows her, them. And they all said that they would, went out on the boats for a long time, like weeks and weeks. So then you would get shrimp that was not. Well, the, I can put your mind to rest because I watch them at like 4.30 in the morning and they go zoop and they go out. And then in the afternoon they go zoop and they come back. Oh, if that so makes glad. you feel better. <laughs> oh, it does make me feel better. It's one of our most favorite things to do is to watch them leave in the dark in the morning and then watch them come back home. <laughs> they look like pirate ships, don't they? Yes, they're beautiful in the yeah. like, rustic sort yeah. of way. <laughs> of all the ships, I think that they're beautiful with their art with their nets. 
but yes. So if I'm for shrimp, you can feel okay about them. Okay. <laughs> I don't know about the other North Carolina. <laughs> okay, because in, in South Carolina, most of our boats were small boats, yeah. and we get we get fish, shrimp, and fish that's caught that day. Yeah, I and know so it's 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 diminishing. However, so we scared. have to treasure what we have. We're spoiled. Yeah. But living in the south near the coast. Natalie, you know, usually we ask our guests for a writing tip, but I thought I would ask you for a cooking tip. Do you have one fail-safe recipe or tip that can save a home cook's life? Never tell anybody what you're serving. Ah. Ooh. I like that. So you don't want to hear if somebody is a vegan or oh, no. You can you can uh, ask them uh, what what okay. their food allergies are okay. and everything. But if if it doesn't work out right, that's right. You're covered. That's you can smart. Call it in. You can you know in this day and age you can get carry out. So. Um, I'm I'm covering up because this the way that I'm sitting now makes my neck. <laughs> so so um so you know, did you notice it? Of course I no. see I see those people that are closer to my age that have higher necklines. Listen, I, I'm wearing a turtleneck. That I mean I I, I came prepared. Strategy. Yeah. I, have, I have rainbow light all over my face. So I mean Yeah. Well I'm sitting in a deeper chair because I have to be close to the browser. So anyway, um if you don't tell anyone what you're serving, then you can always substitute. Right. That's so smart. And that is brilliant. brilliant. Oh, I'm going to have you over for my special crab cake. And then the <laughs> crab cake turns out to be, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. or ha you, you, you just don't have to be embarrassed. You can do something else. Right. Yeah. Always, because you always have eggs in your refrigerator and cream. You could always make me an omelet, right? Yeah. More, yeah. Or a tea souffle. Absolutely. Yeah, or, or yeah. a meringue. Or a meringue. <laughs> a meringue. Meringues are the other secret weapon, of course. Oh, Patty, you're yeah. muted. Oh. Meringue is my favorite. Oh, yeah. I make meringue. those every Christmas Eve. It's my specialty. Oh, I love meringues. I and I actually my make favorite. a snowball. Ever since, Natalie, you, you served it to me with a 10 or so years ago, I have it every Christmas. Oh, it's no. so pretty. It's, it's so impressive. It's and it's not hard. That's the best part. It's a fairly no. easy recipe. Okay, no, ladies, I don't I've have a lot of hard recipes. recipes. I've got to rein you guys in because we're going to run out of time. Oh, okay. okay. Kristen had a couple of questions from readers that she was going to ask. Right, Kristen? Yeah, so our viewer questions this week actually come from Brenda Gardner and Lisa Harrison. They are, they are the two people who run the Friends in Fiction official book club, which is the book club attached to Friends in Fiction. They have about 3,000 members and they're just doing a great job. So last week, they actually hosted an awesome Friendsgiving complete with recipes um, for their book club members. So we knew they would be perfect to ask you questions. So Brenda Gardner says, Natalie, your legacy has been preserved with your papers housed at USC for future study. Has that been an odd experience to part with your things that way? Yes, it was a strange thing. Um, Cliff Graubart, uh, who uh, was a good friend of Pat Conroy's, uh, approached them about buying mine. And they thought that I was part of, um, part, part of Pat's literary crowd because I was his, his teacher. So they agreed to buy my papers, which was thrilling. Um, it, but it's strange because I had all these notebooks, uh, I've written down every meal that I've had eaten out in a restaurant since about 1975. My. Wow. Wow. So I had all these records of all these meals and of everyone I ate with and what they ate. Oh my goodness. Which 
Wow. As it turns out, actually, now it's going to be really important because people stopped eating in restaurants because of yeah. COVID. Um, and I saved every menu that I could. Sometimes I had to steal them. <laughs> so I have all these menus. Wow. Well. And uh, so I had to part with them. And that has been hard because mm -hmm. you can, anybody could go to the University of South Carolina and read anything they want to because I do write other things uh, when I'm sitting in a restaurant. And, uh, you know, one of the stories in this book is about the scene that I had in the restaurant. Um, and so you can, you, you can write, read a lot of interesting things there. So you get to know me. Right. Oh, that's so interesting. That's wow. incredible. It really that's is. So um, our other, the other woman who runs the book club, Lisa Harrison, has a question I would love to know the answer to also. She says, my work schedule is crazy. And some nights I do not have a lot of time to cook. What is your go-to dish that takes 30 minutes or less to prepare? Oh, I want to know that. Yeah. Okay. Everyone should sit down tonight and write 10 meals that they can make without thinking. Okay. Including pasta, you know, with the potato, with the parsley chopped on it and uh, your pizza and whatever else. 10 dumb recipes that you can make without thinking and you write them on a piece of paper and you put them inside your cabinet and then when you come home and you're too tired and too hungry to cook and you're sort of doing what uh we call the pantry waltz where you're going back <laughs> and forth and back and forth looking for something uh you just look at those. Now I do sausage and apples. Ooh. Oh. Whatever vegetable I have. So, you know, you just cook your sausages and I always keep sausages in the freezer, preferably leek sausage, preferably like Italian sausage. And I keep it in the, ref in the freezer and then I just pull them out and we always have apples. And so I just cook sausage and apples. And then if whatever ever vegetable I have on hand, I just throw in. Wow. That's awesome. Um, what a great tip. That's yeah. totally making that tonight. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that sounds yeah. delightful. Well, but and if you have any leftover, you can make a soup from them. Yeah. And if you and and if you don't want to make a soup, you can make a uh, quiche. Oh my gosh, brilliant. Mm -hmm. I love that. An apple quiche. The yum. That's a great idea. Yeah, you've got yeah. the eggs and the uh, butter. You guys, <laughs> we are just out of time. So, Natalie, thank you so much for Natalie, being here. Natalie, thank you. I have loved it. I have, I'm so excited to be included in I'm this. So, so glad. I'm so included. So, I want to be I want 10% off of my books. Yes, Justin Books. And we hope if you're in the Charleston area, or even if you're not, you can um, call or go online yeah, and go. order. They're offering a 10% discount on Natalie's books as well as ours. And I'll sign them because yes. the Bucks and Books is within half a block of my house. Lucky oh, you. Wow. And wow. I'll, I'll walk there and I'll wow. sign the books, personalize so, yeah, them. Yeah, make sure you do that. Ordered, ordered before. Yeah. You know, before. who doesn't love a Christmas book? A Christmas cookbook, and I, I can order I, some. Sign right them now. right Do from Buck yeah. Books. This is the one that Kathy, uh, Mary Kay, mentioned. Natalie Dupree's favorite stories and recipes, and I showed you. And yes, that's a great. That's a great gift. And for mm -hmm. the one who wants to learn to be a great Southern cook, there we go. Well, yeah, that's good because if you have it's, um, <laughs> it's heavy and if yes. you want to get rid of your waddle. You can have Michelle <laughs> Obama arms. Yeah, right. Now, everybody, you can get back to your Christmas decorating or your wrapping or just maybe 
sitting by your fire with a nice adult beverage and a good book, maybe even a great cookbook. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, Natalie. Thank you, Natalie. Bye. Thank you, Natalie. Bye. Thank you, Natalie. Bye.